Choir and Robert, thank you. It's good to see you. almost full choir loft on this holiday weekend. Glad to see all of you as well. Um, visited with a friend this morning about 7 o'clock, and he said, are you going to have anybody show up for church this morning? And I said, well, I hope we have enough to run the sound crew so we can be on TV. You have surprised me immensely with your attendance this morning, and I'm glad that you've chosen to worship on this holiday weekend. The worship guide says Nehemiah chapter 1 through 5. We're only going to actually kind of summarize chapters 1 through 3. We're not going to read every verse. I'm going to do some summary work and then uh, make some, uh, some applications, I hope, out of that summary work. And I'm aware that when we talk about Nehemiah and he's rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, I am fully aware that building walls is a very contentious idea in our society right now. So please don't take any wall building from Nehemiah to be an endorsement of any ideas circulating in the American political system. As we'll think of this as uh, taking care of business close to home, if you'll allow me to, to make that metaphor in that transition. We're living in a time when the issues seem big and they seem complicated and they seem overwhelming. A week ago Thursday, the United Kingdom, Britain, voted to exit the, U the European Union. And I had a person tell me, said, I think that's a big thing, but I don't know enough about it. Well, I'll tell you my summary of it, and may or may not be fully accurate, but there's two things that the European Union did. One was it established trade agreements, and they could act like the United States of Europe, and they could sell Italian cars in Germany freely with no tariffs and everything can move across the lines. The second thing that the European Union did was it allowed the free movement of people throughout those 28 countries without any hindrances whatsoever. You could be raised in one country, go to school in another country, and work in a third country without any hindrances whatsoever. There were no visas. There was just simply one EU passport used to transport and move across the lines. There's where the real problem lied. In the fact that once you were in the European Union, you could go anywhere you wanted to go. And as Tom Friedman's going to say in his new book that's coming out this February, and this, excuse me, the next November, He's going to say that our world is moving from the disorganized to the organized. And he draws a line east to west through the Mediterranean Ocean. And he says below that line, we are witnessing the disorganization of society and government. And his theory is that the Cold War allowed the Soviet Union and the United States to prop up for strategic reasons these smaller little countries and we educated their children and we built their infrastructure and we propped up their governments and we supported and trained their armies. But after the Cold War, when all of that support and all that education dwindled away, these nations below that line running through the Mediterranean Ocean are no longer able to be organized. And so the people below that line are moving north toward organization. For instance, 50,000 Ethiopians marched across the Sinai Desert and into Israel last year, moving from disorganization in Ethiopia toward organization in Israel. And the Israelis have no idea what to do with 50,000 Ethiopians who showed up on their doorstep. They have even offered them money if you will go home. We will pay you to go home and we will pay you to stay home. And they said no. Well, in the European Union, once you were allowed into that European Union and once you were given that passport, you're free to move among all of those 28 countries. And if you're in Greece and you're suffering through the terrible economic turmoil in Greece, you're able now to move to France and get a job. And the goal of all movement from disorganized to organized is to somehow get to the promised land, and the promised land is London. If you can make it to London, you can make it in the world. And the folks in the British government in the UK said, this is out of control. 
and they voted to leave the European Union because they couldn't take the free flow of immigration any longer. And that's a big topic that affected your retirement last week and is still affecting your retirement and is going to affect your retirement for weeks and months to come. It's a big thing and it's hard to get your mind around it and you're really not sure what to do about it. I've, um, I read this week and I read the business report. I didn't read the whole trustee report, but the Social Security trustees released their report late last week. And it's on the page 167 that Social Security is now having to borrow money to meet its obligations. Now, they say they're not going to run out of money until 2030, but if you read that report, they borrowed $200 billion the last three years, 70 last year alone to meet Social Security obligations. That, to me, feels like an awfully big problem that I don't have a clue how to solve, nor does our system. This week, we've had two more terrorist attacks one in Turkey and one in Pakistan. It's caused all of us to be on edge about where we live. Thursday night, we're sitting with a family who visited the church last Sunday and their sweet kids in Leal's. We met them at 7. It's getting close to 8.30, something like that. The room is filled up with a, a much younger, much rowdier crowd. And somebody in that crowd popped a firecracker. And you know how when you hear about things and you read about things, you say, this is what I would do? No, here's what you do. You sit frozen in your chair wondering, what was that? There's no turning over tables. There's no protecting the women and children. You just freeze. And I froze. And so did Jeff King sitting across the table from me and made me feel better that so did the policeman sitting 10 feet away from me. He's trained for this and he did exactly what we all did. He froze. Except for one thing. He called that girl's mama. And she left the, restroom, left the restaurant in a rush. But what happened in Turkey and what happened in Pakistan and what happened in San Bernardino and what happened in Orlando has caused all of us to be on edge. And we don't know how to deal with these big global issues that just seem to surround us and consume us and we don't know how it's going to sort out and what it all means. And we've got issues in our culture. Social media and the computer have moved our cultural ideas so quickly and so fast that we have watched in the last 10 years a lot of values that many of us in conservative Christian environments have held very dear, and they have been consistently pushed to the margins. And we think, what in the world is happening to us? So how do we... How do we nibble away at all the chaos and all the confusion all around us? Well, I hope the book of Nehemiah might have a couple of ideas for us. In the first chapter of Nehemiah, he is serving as the king's cupbearer. In other words, he keeps the king's cup full of wine. And he's serving the king of Persia, and they are... They are enjoying themselves in Persia. They have been, they have been carried away when he was a child from Israel and yet Persia has become home and it's become a comfortable place but his brother shows up and he says hey you're not going to believe what's happened to the land of our ancestors he says the graves where our ancestors are have been desecrated he said the walls of the city have been torn down the gates have been burned the people are in economic ruin it's absolute chaos at home and Nehemiah's countenance fell and in the first chapter of Nehemiah, he offers this prayer to God. I said, O oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant. For now I pray before you day and night for your servants, 
the people of Israel, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you. Both I and my family have sinned. We've offended you deeply, failing to keep the commandments, the statutes, the ordinances that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them through, though your outcasts are under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place at which I've chosen to establish my name. They are your servants and your people, whom you redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayers of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. At the time, I was the cupbearer to the king. Now in this prayer... Nehemiah reminded God of his promise of faithfulness. And he repented of the sins of the people. He confessed his own sins. He confessed his family's sins. And he reiterated the sins of the people one more time. He said, I know they have offended you. And I know they did not keep your commandments. But he asked the Lord to remember the promises he gave to Moses that if the people would be faithful, he would gather them back and he would establish them in the land in which he's established them. Notice in this prayer, Nehemiah never, never prayed for a game plan. He never prayed for a goal. He never prayed for a strategy. He asked the Lord to bring his people home and to be merciful. Well, Nehemiah leaves it all to God. Now, in the second chapter, Nehemiah is serving the king the next day and the king notices that Nehemiah is sad. And he said, you're always happy. Why are you sad today? And he said, oh, king, my people at home are lying in ruins and the walls have been torn down and the gates have been burned and the graves of my ancestors have been desecrated and everything is ruined. So in the second chapter, in the third verse, Nehemiah says to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my ancestors' graves, lies waste and the gates have been destroyed by fire? And the king said, well, what do you want me to do about it? And Nehemiah said, I want you to, I want you to let me go home and rebuild the walls and rebuild my city. And the king said, how long is that going to take? Isn't that a great question? That's what, that's what administrators always ask. How long is that going to take? And Nehemiah never answered that question because there is no answer to that question. But the king blessed him and he gave him letters and he said, you can give these letters to the military officials along the way and they will let you pass. And, and Nehemiah went back and he asked for a letter to the keeper of the forest so that he could have lumber to rebuild the gates. And the king gave him the letter for the lumber and he sent him on his way and he returned back to Jerusalem and everybody was glad to see him. No. No. The Hornites and the Ammonites were not glad to see him because they enjoyed ravaging the city of Jerusalem. But Nehemiah showed back up with his men and they camped outside the city. And during the night, Nehemiah got on his horse and he started trying to ride around the city. And he made his way about halfway around and he got over to the fountain gate and the rubble was so high and in such a mess and so big that his horse couldn't continue around. So he went back the next morning. He woke up all the men and he gave them a summary of what he had seen. He gathered together all the priests that he could find and all the scribes and all the citizens. And he said to them in the 17th verse, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we're in? How Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned? Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we may no longer suffer disgrace. And I told them that the hand of God had been gracious upon me and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And then they said, let us start building. So they committed themselves to the common good. Now Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite mocked them saying, the king doesn't care anything about this wall. 
and doesn't care about rebuilding the city. And Nehemiah answered him and said, the God of heaven is going to help us rebuild this city. And in the third chapter, you began to see how Nehemiah divided up the work. And that's where I want to camp out this morning. In the third chapter, the high priest and his men, they started on the sheep gate. And they rebuilt the wall from the sheep gate all the way to the tower of 100. And in the other direction, another Hanel and his men built toward the other tower. And then the, America, the men of Jericho took over from that section of the wall. And Zechor, the son of Amorite, he built along with the men of Jericho. And then another group started at the fish gate, and on and on and on and on. Everyone is doing their part, but he begins by building in these central areas. The high priest was building here. The men of Jericho were building here. Another group of priests was building here. And then he divides up the work among where the people live. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 3, verse 21. After him, Menemoth, son of Uriah, son of Hegagos, repaired another section from the door of the house of Elip, Eliseb to the end of the house of Eliseb. All he built was the wall, the width of a house. And after him, the priest and the men surrounding area made repairs. And then Benjamin and Hasub made repairs opposite their house. And then Hariza, son of Manasseh, son of Harana, made repairs beside his own house. Merrimoth came in and he just built right there the width of Eliab's house. And then another came in and he built across the street from his house. And then others came in and they built just from corner to corner and from spot to spot. You see, he moved from centralized building and centralized authority to people taking care of their own little part of the world. We live in a world with these big problems. And we're not sure how to solve them. And we have no idea how to influence the UK pulling out of the EU and making all of our retirements go down more than they were. Nothing you can do about that. And we seem to be swimming upstream on cultural issues. And we seem to live in a world where Islamists, extremists, have taken their ideology in places we cannot understand and are willing to kill other people for it and themselves. And I can't understand that. But I wonder if the Lord might not be talking to us about doing something in our part of the world. Majora Carter graduated from college at Wesleyan College in New York. She grew up in South Harlem. And she graduated from college and she moved back home to live with her parents to work on a master's degree at NYU and save a little money. And we know how that works. She saved money, her parents did not. But she's working on her master's degree and she comes upon a stray dog, a stray puppy, and she gathers that dog up and she takes that dog home and she tells her parents, I found this dog and I'm gonna love this dog. And she said, what happened was that, that puppy became a big dog. And that dog needed a lot of exercises. So she, I, I took up jogging, she says. And I used to let that dog drag me through Harlem. And she said, our neighborhood handled 40% of the waste for New York City. We had two sewage treatment plants. We had four power plants. All of it built along the river. And from our part of South Harlem, you couldn't even get to the river. Everything was fenced off. And she said, our neighborhood was so bad that people thought you were either a pimp, a prostitute, or a pusher in our part of the world. But she said, I'm out running with this dog, and he's dragging me, and he turns down this street, and he turns down this street, and he turns down another street. And before you know it, he has dead-ended into the river. She said, I had never even seen that there was river in our neighborhood. She said, I looked at that. We have riverfront property in South Harlem. She said, I walked up and down it, came back the next day, walked up and down it and thought, if we could just clean this up, if we could just get the trash out of here, 
It can be a, it be, it can be a pleasant place to walk. So she went to the city and they gave her a $10,000 grant and she told some folks and they told some folks and they told some more folks and before you know it, they transformed that $10,000 into $3 million and erected a 11 acre park in South Harlem right along the river. She said, it not only changed my view of the world, it changed our whole neighborhood all because a dog drug her down the street to a place she didn't even know existed. Carter Jimenez, the junior high student, and he was reading one day in class that two billion people do not have access to clean water and 2.8 billion people in the world don't have access to any kind of sanitation. So he got to talking to some teachers and they talked in student government and they formed, they, they, formed, they started forming a little club and they're in the school. They were going to raise money to start providing clean water. Students for clean water started in a junior high and after about three months they had enough money to dig their first well in Honduras. And for the last 10 years they've been digging wells all over the undeveloped world. And it all started with a kid who read, there's two billion people in this world that don't have access to clean water. Lena Robinson began in her eighth grade year to become anorexic. She said, I, I didn't know how bad it was until my mom came in one day while I was in the shower and took my measuring cup. She said they had been trying to get my attention and they had taken away my cell phone. She said, you can have my cell phone. But in her sophomore years of high school, her mom came in and took her measuring cup. And she said, I panicked. She said, everything in my world revolved around that measuring cup and making sure I didn't eat anything that wouldn't fit in that cup at the right time of day and in the right hour. She said, that was when I knew I needed help. So Lena continued to go to school. She graduated from high school, been in counseling, been in therapy, graduates from college. She becomes a junior high teacher, and guess what? She can spot anorexia in her classroom. And she visited with parents, and she told them her story, and they said, we don't have money. We don't have money for counseling. We don't have money for therapy. So Lena set up her own 501c3, and people give money to that, and people are blessing those little girls who had no ability to get counseling to get counseling and to overcome that eating disorder. One person. Allsbury Baptist Church in Burleson, Texas, has a unique demographic. Surrounding their church, they have a high concentration of special needs kids. On any given Sunday of their congregation of 500 or so gathered, they'll have 50 plus special needs children in the worship service. He said, we've got wheelchairs. We've got children who can't speak. We've got children who can't communicate at all. He said, we've got all of the issues that you'd find in any institution in our church on any given Sunday morning. And he said, it, it takes some patience. He said, our services are never orderly. There's always something going on in our services. He said, we don't know how the Lord brought this to us, but in our neighborhood, this is who we are. Well, the Baptist Network works through the Baptist General Convention of Texas and Baptist traveling in Germany, and they stumbled upon a church in Germany who was having the very same things go on. So two weeks ago, 23 people from Burleson, Texas, flew to Germany to work with the church about how to manage and how to take care of special needs kids, and they did all the training, the facility tra evaluations, the medical training, everything that goes with it. But they took... Tucker and Dorchester, two young men who have Down syndrome. And he said, uh, when Tucker and Dorchester arrived in Germany, the people who met them at the airport who were there to help special needs kids didn't know what to do with these two. 
So Tucker and Georgechester just made themselves available to the Germans. And they went, brought themselves into conversations. They said, we told that they told the Germans, we'll teach you how to play soccer, which is unusual for Texans to teach Germans how to play soccer. We know how to play it. We'll teach you how to play it. The pastor said when we got home, those two, those two boys with Down syndrome taught the Germans more about the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ than we plan to. You see, I don't know what we're going to do about the big problems, but there's probably somebody in your neighborhood and in my neighborhood who needs a cup of cold water. There's probably a need or a niche in our community that needs addressing. There's probably somebody who needs a helping hand. There's probably somebody who needs a vision. Nehemiah went home and he gave the task, the big task, to some of the bigger groups. But then he told some of them, said, you just build the wall across the street from your house. And you just build from this corner to this corner. And you just take care of it in your place. And together, they got it all built. Maybe we need to just change the world right around, right around us. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, on this weekend of celebration, when we celebrate the place where you've placed us and the country in which we enjoy and which we love, Lord, I help, pray that you help us to open our eyes not to the big things, not to the big headaches that just cause us despair, but Lord, open our eyes to what's right across the street, to what's next door, to what's in our classrooms, to who's standing right beside us. May we be the hands and feet of Christ in our world. And may, Lord, the good things of the gospel change what's around us and spread around the world. Lord, I hope you find us faithful to open our eyes and to look around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is Shine, Jesus, Shine. I encourage you to come this morning, claiming faith in Christ, joining with our church and membership. Maybe the Lord lays on your heart this morning something in your neighborhood you ought to do. Let's hear his call and let's be faithful. Let's stand and sing together.